It's the 10th of June. Good evening, I'm Tom Glasson. Now, in light of Tony Abbott arriving in the United States and fighting against Obama's climate change policy, I'm going to act all American. Ooh! My country created some of the most important cultural works of the 20th century. Now we're trying to save the world from environmental collapse! Typical Americans, welcome to the roast. Tonight, Tony Abbott takes on President Obama's environmental policy and West Australia announces an extension of its shark culling program. A state-sponsored massacre and hating on America. Who are we, communist Russia? Am I right? <laughs> First, though, here's Mark Humphreys with the headlines. Clive Palmer has hit back at Channel 7's Sunday night program after they aired footage of someone embarrassing the Palmer United Party. That someone was, of course, the Palmer United Party. Fortunately, Clive's got the perfect PR strategy to help them bounce back. Clive Palmer has called the veteran journalist a dickhead. So just to recap, Clive Palmer thinks Mike Willisey's a dickhead, Wendy Deng's a Chinese spy, and the Prime Minister is Eagle Boys. Well, hello, Tony. Can I order some takeaway, please? But Clive's not too concerned about how his party came off. He's checked the internet. The court of public opinion's the best place, and if you go to the Channel 7 blogs, you'll see three and a half, four thousand Australians went on the blog last night to say that Mike Willisey's a dickhead. While there certainly were a few people unimpressed with Mike Willisey's interviewing style, we could only find one person who called Mike Willisey a dickhead. And that person proves the court of public opinion is indeed the best place to go for sound political analysis. Mike Willisey was and is drunken dickhead. I seen him make dickhead of himself pissed on TV. Meanwhile, former MP Pauline Hanson has leapt to the defence of Senator-elect Ricky Muir. In other words, things have just gotten worse for Ricky Muir. Miss Hanson says she's keen to talk to Ricky. Just pick up the phone. That'd be some phone call. Ricky? Ricky? Oh, sorry, can we start that question again? But it's not just former Dancing with the Stars contestants who are offering him political advice. Leading independent Senator Nick Xenophon says he's been trying to meet Ricky Muir. Well, it's going to be a very steep learning curve for him, and I think there are people on the crossbenches who genuinely want to be helpful. Come on, Ricky, meet with Nick Xenophon. I think you'll find you're not the Senate's only motoring enthusiast. For the first time ever, a supercomputer has fooled humans into thinking it's a real person. No, I'm not talking about Kevin Andrews. I'm referring to a computer that passed the iconic Turing test, which tests a machine's ability to exhibit human intelligence, as distinct from Mike Willisey, who tests a human's ability to exhibit human intelligence. The computer convinced a third of interrogators that he was Eugene Gustman, a 13-year-old boy from Ukraine, or as police in the online child protection department call him, Bait. Eugene also came with a backstory. He owns a pet guinea pig and his father works as a gynaecologist. I understand that profession was chosen by Gary in programming. However, there is a reason why Eugene was made a 13-year-old. His designers chose the age specifically for its suitability to the Turing test. Understandable. As a 13-year-old boy, the supercomputer only had to learn three words, cool, awesome and mom. So there you have it. We've created the next step in our eventual demise and his name is Eugene. For the roast, I'm Mark Humphreys. Thank you, Mark. Well, first up tonight, Prime Minister Tony Abbott, seen here digging the Earth's grave, has landed in Washington, D.C. to meet with President Obama. What an idiot. Doesn't Abbott know Boston's the place to go to learn about Australian politics? But upon arrival, Abbott immediately got to work responding to Obama's bold new climate change policy. Tony Abbott is seeking a conservative alliance among like-minded countries aiming to dismantle global moves to introduce carbon pricing. Well, it looks like it's time for another instalment of our ongoing segment, Tony Abbott's Please Don't Embarrass Australia in Front of Other Countries Tour. Oh. <laughs> so, on his trip away, he is trying to dismantle global carbon pricing and form an international coalition of... I know you've got all this research, but my gut tells me I'm right. Why can't he be more like Scarlett Johansson in Lost in Translation and just stay locked in his hotel room moping around in underwear? But instead of moping, Abbott has been busy undermining Barack Obama and trying to form a coalition of like-minded countries, including Canada, India, the United Kingdom and New Zealand. And if he's successful, it will just go to show what you can achieve when you work together to stop great things. And the White House, well, it's not happy. 
I think everyone except the climate deniers are deeply concerned with the direction Australia is going. Oh, everyone except the climate deniers? So who's that? Well, everyone else on the planet? Jazz Twemlow joins us now live. Jazz, is this a wise move by the Prime Minister? Previously, our Prime Minister limited his science phobia to Australia, which is surrounded by rising oceans. Well done. But now he wants the UK, Canada, New Zealand, China and India to join with us in protest, like a sort of Westboro Baptist church if the global price on carbon was a gay dead soldier. Tony Abbott has justified his position by arguing that carbon pricing would clobber the economy, though Mother Nature has said that if no one does anything about global warming, she will set fire to Australia before burying it in the ocean. Good luck with that economy thing, though. So perhaps Tony Abbott should disband his international coalition of carbon, let the US do something to save the planet, and he can just sort of stay at home and kind of read a book with pictures. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Jazz. Got to say, it's hard to believe some people would go to such lengths just to find others to validate their bad ideas. That said, winter's here, so maybe some global warming wouldn't be that bad after all, am I right? <laughs> am, I, am I right? Where's the guy? I feel like I'm right. Guys, just one sec. Guys, am I right? Am I right? <laughs> hey, am I right? <laughs> hey, am I right? Which floor? Seven. Yep. <laughs> am I right? <laughs> Oh, am I right? <laughs> am I right? <laughs> am I right? Dorothy? 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 Nah, you're busy. <laughs> am I right? While Tom seeks validation, why don't you jump online and answer tonight's question? Have you ever gone to extreme lengths to find someone else who agrees with you? Why did you keep looking? Are you too proud to admit when you're wrong? We'd love to hear about it at the Roast TV or hashtag Roast TV. Am I right, guys? Yeah, I'm totally right. Finally tonight, sharks are under threat with the West Australian government proposing an extension of its controversial shark culling policy. A policy many regard as the worst shark related disaster since Sharknado. Now it's predicted about 900 tiger sharks and 25 great white sharks will be caught over the next three years. But there have been reassurances that since there will be fewer than 10 great whites killed each year, there was only a remote likelihood the cull would affect the southwestern Australian shark population. So don't worry, we're not killing all the sharks, just the bad ones, which WA Premier Colin Barnett identified by airboarding a hammerhead. Airboarding, of course, being the same barbaric torture technique used to find the whereabouts of Osama Finn Sharkin. But given sharks kill less people than vending machines, drowning in the bath, Christmas trees being left-handed, lightning, icicles, beds, dogs, mosquitoes, falling coconuts, obesity, hippos, autoerotic asphyxiation, roller coasters and cows, is this all just a case of bad publicity for sharks because they've killed a few humans? I mean, why aren't we hunting down the vending machine that killed my grandpa? The man only wanted pretzels, he didn't deserve to die. But no, people aren't scared of vending machines like they are of sharks because films like Jaws vilify sharks. And you know who made Jaws? A human. Things would be a lot different if sharks could crack the three-act structure. Bruce the shark thought he had it all. Happiness, freedom, seal meat. But above the ocean's surface, a deadly killer was lurking. Irrationally scared man. No understanding. But I'll catch him and kill him. No remorse. You're gonna need a bigger boat. This summer, be very afraid. Because when you're minding your own business, their business is death. Oh, you son of a... Coming this summer, Great White Man. Oh, I'll see anything directed by Shark Fin Spill Shark. My favourites are Jurassic Shark, Raiders of the Lost Shark, and Catch Me If You Can. You know, the one about the shark pretending to be a pilot. So does WA's shark culling policy have any merit? Well, Colin Barnett declared the trial run a success, but it did cost a million dollars, didn't kill any great whites, and some argue may have even endangered people by drawing sharks close to the beach thanks to bait systems near the shoreline. 
On the other hand, though, shark attacks, a thing that almost never happens, didn't happen for three months. It's just like how I eat raw garlic every day to ward off vampires. Ten years on, still haven't suffered a single vampire attack. Logic checks out. Alex Lee, is this shark cull justified? Tom, imagine if I was a shark and I came into your territory and started killing you. If I just walked into your house, where you live... Yeah, Alex, I've heard this analogy before. That's your house, Tom. You should feel safe there. I do feel safe. It's on the Look, land. Look, let's put the shoe on the other fin for the moment to expose the ignorance being displayed by man. Now, as a shark, my house... Al you're not a shark. It's a... <gasps> oh. Back to you. Tom. Oh, jeez, poor Alex. She, she's never going to get a deposit back for that costume. Still, maybe we should look at this from the other side of the coin. Why are sharks eating humans in the first place? Because some sharks are just criminals, Tom. You know I had to harpoon a criminal shark over there who hijacked our green screen like a jerk? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you stupid shark. That was Alex. Eh, yeah, don't give it a name, Tom. It's not a person. It was. It's a criminal. But we can't blame all sharks for the actions of a few jerk sharks. OK, so Nick, as an amateur expert in shark criminology, what would you recommend? Well, despite what you just saw, I don't believe in the death penalty. Unless those jerk sharks are guilty of a crime. OK, but how can we tell a guilty shark from an innocent one? Oh, because all sharks look the same to you, don't they, Tom? I'll just let your interspecies racism hang there for a few seconds. But you do raise a good point, all sharks do look exactly the same. So if we can't identify which sharks are the one in a million criminal sharks, then we shouldn't be killing any of them. Because you know what that would make us, Tom? Uh, entitled humans think we should have free reign over the entire ocean. Yep, dickheads. Am I right? Yeah, I'm right. That's exactly Good night. Right.